Welcome everybody to um, our panel today. My name is Jana Renstrom and I'm the founder and president of the COTA Alliance. And our co-host is Professor Valara Susan Gorosorki, who represents our partner organization, uh, Center for Migration, Gender and Justice. And she joins me from Portland, Oregon. Uh, it's noontime here in New York and our other panelists join us from various time zones. We have Tanzila Khan from Lahore, Pakistan. We have Catherine Ainamani from Kabbalah District in Uganda, um, but Minnie Murthy from New York, and Christina Toledo Cornell from Bellingham in Washington State. Um, so, welcome to all of our guests, um, wherever you are. Uh, in fact, if you're not in New York, it would be really fun for us to see where you are. You can type in the chat box your location. Uh, we'd love to see that. We hope everyone is coping well and staying strong in these difficult times all around the globe. Um, after the panel, there'll be a Q&A, which we'll conduct by you typing your questions into the chat box, which you can do anytime during the presentation. Um, and just a few words about the CODA Alliance. We are a New York State registered nonprofit founded in 2015 and work for gender equality and women's empowerment. We currently have over 50 civil society organization partners with the same or similar goals. We work to increase the visibility of the issues that they promote and to increase their competence and impact through workshops, fundraising help, resource sharing, networking and collaboration. So if you are an individual or an organization with similar goals, please join our community. Um, as we look to the sustainable development goals and realizing Agenda 2030, we realize that there's a still a lot of work to be done uh, in the state of health of people all over the world. Uh, and it's a known fact that women suffer from particular problems related to a biological difference and or discrimination, and therefore fare worse on many indicators. When we look at it from an intersectional angle, we discover subgroups that fare even worse. Uh, that's why we invited people who represent or work for some of these marginalized groups to get their view of the challenges that remain and hopefully also some news about progress. Since the topic is collaboration, we also want to find out if there are any signs of progress in that regard. Um, for instance, between grassroots organizations and their own governments or amongst each other in countries or in global contexts. Um, because the field is so wide and our time is limited, we had to pick and choose our panelists and leave out many important issues, which hopefully can be discussed in other settings. Um, I just want to mention a few out of serious concern in the United States. Um, the increased maternal mortality, which mostly affects women of color. Pregnancy-related deaths have increased um, since 1987, when it was 7.2 deaths per 100,000 live births to 16.9 deaths per 100,000 live births in 2016. However, the numbers of black, non-Hispanic women are three times higher, and for American Indian or Alaskan Native non-Hispanic women, two times higher. This is a complex problem, and there are attempts ongoing to figure out why this is happening um, and to increase funding programs, uh, funding for programs that address the issue, at least here in New York City. Um, another concern is women in prison. The United States is home to just 4% of the world's female population, yet the U.S. is responsible for 33% of the entire world's incarcerated female population. Women in prison suffer disproportionately from many conditions like HIV AIDS, infectious diseases within prisons, reproductive issues, and chronic diseases. They also experience physical and mental health issues due to histories of poverty, unemployment, drug abuse, and physical abuse or violence. Uh, recently, attention has been brought to cruel and inhuman practices that women are subjected to in prisons. For instance, the shackling of women in labor and the denying of menstrual hygiene supplies. Um, the third concern, um, intimate partner violence and ex its exacerbation by widespread access to guns. 600 women in the U.S. die each year from gun violence, much of it perpetrated by a current or former partner. Um, fourth, Obviously, the ongoing fight for sexual and reproductive rights, in particular fighting attempts to overturn Roe v. Wade, which affects all women in this country. And lastly, as we know, in the U.S., the coronavirus pandemic is affecting people of color, including women, disproportionately. 
Um, so let's go to our panelists now. I'd like to do a quick round of introduction, or actually you can introduce yourselves. And so I'd like to ask, like in 30 seconds or, or a minute, uh, please introduce yourself and tell us how you came to do what you do now. And also, if you like, you can mention um, how you're coping with the COVID um, situation personally at this point. Uh, let's start with, um, with Lara. Yes, thank you so much, Jana and the co <laughs> having me for having us the Center for Migration, Gender and Justice. I'm Dr. Lara Zazango Sorki and I am an Assistant Professor for Political Science and Global Affairs, as well as Gender and Women's Studies at the University of Portland in, in Oregon in the US. Um, my expertise lies in migration, gender, civil and human rights. I am also the Founder, Executive Director and Director of Advocacy at the Center for Migration, Gender and Justice, which celebrates its four month anniversary today. Uh, we just launched on International Women's Day this year. This was supposed to happen within the context of the UN Commission on the Status of Women, um, but that didn't happen because of COVID-19. Um, so here we are. As a scholar, activist, educator, and a migrant woman myself, I have advocated for migrant rights and gender justice across institutional levels, including at the UN, uh, the European Parliament, and the European Commission. And I really look forward to learning from and with you today as we address gendered health in a global context. Thank you. Good, thank you. Um, let's go to Minnie Murthy. Yeah, hi. Uh, thanks, Jana. Hi, everybody. So I just wanted to say that, and can you see me? My camera is on? Yeah. Okay, great. So I wanted to say I'm a physician, um, a public health professional, and uh, I'm a professor at New York Medical College. I head up the global health um, program at uh, the School of Health Sciences and Practice. And uh, I represent MWIA at the UN through my own NGO, American Medical Women's Association. We've been around for 103 years, and I'm not 103 years anyway. So <laughs> I just want to make so. But one of the things is yes, I my background is a women's health and human rights, and uh, I have, I'm an author, a poet, and uh, I think I was born with an activist gene. Um, and for some reason, Lana, I don't see myself on camera. I see, a, and I hear a lot of background noise. So I don't know what's going on. Anyway, so I am a. Um, uh, so my area of expertise is women's health and human rights. And I, I guess I was born with an activist gene because I always think, uh, you know, public health to me is a calling, uh, especially women's health as a woman, as a mother, I think uh, mother of a daughter, we are really left out of the loop. And I'm trying to see whatever I can do through my NGO and my um, um, personal uh, um, efforts to get, um, uh, you know, address women's needs. And also, how did I get to do this? Because when I was a, a young girl growing up in India, I saw how women were treated and they did not even have access to pads. So, and everybody, all the domestic people who used to work for my mother loved to come there because my mother used to buy them pads when she used to buy pads for my sister and I. So this started getting me, um, you know, aware of inequalities. And my parents always taught us that, you know, you respect somebody not based on their um, socioeconomic status. And how am I coping with COVID by writing poems, doing yoga, uh, keeping in touch with friends and going for long walks uh, with my daughter, like up and down my street, because we live in a cul-de-sac and, uh, you know, and wearing a mask, which is most important. So thank you so much, uh, Jana, for having this panel and uh, look forward to continuing the conversation. Thank you. Great, okay, let's go to Christina. Thank you so much for having me. I'm Christina Toledo Cornell. Uh, I work here at the Lummi Tribal Health Center. I'm a primary care doctor. I, I see both uh, men and women, adult patients, but my one of my biggest um, uh, focus is in um, women's health. Uh, and I am their primary, uh, their public health director. So one of my biggest job is to respond to um, health emergencies and have been focused a lot about uh, our response here at the community to COVID-19. Great, thank you. Tanzila. Assalamualaikum everyone. I'm Tanzila from Lahore, Pakistan, and I'm an entrepreneur. 
I enjoy creating sustainable solutions for women's health, particularly SRHR. I also happen to have a disability, which to me is an advantage because that gives me an um, that gives me a perspective and a lens of inclusivity to see other systems. And I see a lot of flaws, and my job is to suggest some solutions. Other than that, I also work for capacity building and. My medium is creativity, theater, and recently I also jumped into filmmaking, making Pakistan's first comedy short film on disability. Yay! <laughs> Thank you. Fantastic. Okay, Catherine, let's hope the internet is working. Catherine Ainamani from um, Uganda. Can you, uh, let me unmute you, see if it works from here. I can see you. Okay. There you go. No, nope, you're on mute now. Click again. Let's, let me try from here. So, um, Catherine was just before we got started, she was saying there were a lot of, there was a heavy rain in the area and uh, internet connection issues. So, um, but then at one point she came through really well. I don't know what's going on now. Um, there we go. Hello. Hello. Go ahead. Yes, Jenna. Uh, hello, everyone. I hope you're uh, hearing me pretty well. Yes. Yeah, I'm sorry I couldn't turn on the video because the, net the network is really poor here. Okay. Hello. Yeah, so I'm um, Aina Man Catherine, 29 years, and I'm the original coordinator of ALO in Western Uganda. Oops, now we lost her again, I think. Um, ALOA is the all-in-one women's association, uh, one of our new partner organizations in Uganda. And uh, they have just recently um, started a- Our ultimate- There you go, Hello. okay. You were cut off for yeah, a while. Our ultimate goal at ALOA is promote and foster social, economic, and culture, and political- Ah, oh, see, it's patchy of women in Western Uganda, and LGBTI rights. Right. So the LGBTI community, including uh, access to healthcare facilities and uh, victim services, that is if needed. So we are developing an intensified strategic approach with the overall goal to advocate the protection and uh, promotion of LGBTI rights and groups. So this has happened. discrimination and the extremely limited protection of the LGBTI groups by trying to address the causes for homophobia. Mm, it's very patchy. Um, so Catherine, um, I hope you can hear us. Um, Let's move on with the program and we'll get back to you uh, in a bit and hopefully that hopefully the connection will be better. Okay. Let's see. I can't even mute. So um, let's see what's happening here. Strange. Okay. Well, let's just we'll have to play it by ear a little bit. Um, Let's um, move on. I wanted to start with a kind of a global outlook uh, or overview, and I think Minnie Murthy would be the best one to do that. Um, so would you like to start? Sure. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, everybody. And it's great to, uh, you know, see all of you and listen to all of you, because I think uh, this just shows women power. And um, I think it's awful that in 2020, we need to keep saying, yes, we have women, so listen to us. And um, I just would like to start off by a quote, which I really like. If we are to fight discrimination and injustice among women, we must start from the home. For if a woman cannot be safe in her home, then she cannot be expected to feel safe anywhere. This is by Aisha Tarya. Now, as we know, COVID is raging. I mean, we had a different life before March, and now we have a different life. 
The impact on women and girls, unfortunately, as we know, has been devastating. And it, in it includes rising rates of domestic or intimate partner violence and forced marriages. I don't have to tell you all about this because you see this happening every day in the work you do. And unfortunately, lockdowns are great, but there is no lockdown for gender-based violence, a co-panelist and attendees. And unfortunately, it has become, I use the term, it's a pandemic within a pandemic. And it's a silent pandemic, we know. And unfortunately, women have become more and more isolated and they have very few avenues to turn to for help. And many of them are financially dependent on their abusers because a lot of them have lost their jobs. And not only that, they have to, you know, they're facing the brunt of taking um, the uh, unemployment of the spouse who's taking it out on them. So many of them, or of these women, actually their homes have become their cells and uh, they are really uh, suffering a lot. And I just wanted to uh, say one thing, um, you know, Jana, you uh, do so much of uh, uh, excellent work and, you know, from my NGO, from American Medical Women's, Medical Women, we're always happy to work with you. But one of the things which I have found is because we've been sending PPEs, working with other NGOs, is women do not have access to sanitary pads. I'm not even talking about pregnancy and lack of access to maternal care, safe motherhood ladies, but I'm talking about lack, and gentlemen, I'm talking about a lack of access to pads. So one of the things, uh, they don't have money, and how would they go in a lockdown to get uh, a pad? Because even though there is a lockdown, the physiological function has not shut down. So one of the things, and I think, Jana, we need to talk about this later, is I'm working with one of the NGOs where we are giving recyclable pads. Mm -hmm. And I've had, you know, uh, members of my family and my, uh, some of my medical students test these out because they're recyclable pads which can be used. Now, the problem is if you don't have running water, because we send PPE to the Navajo Nation, We've, you know, as we know, Navajo Nation is, is so badly affected. And it's in this country, they're facing the same challenges as some other countries. By this country, I mean the United States. So if you don't have running water, you have a recyclable pad. How are you going to wash it? And these recyclable pads, there is a message which just flashed on the screen, is made from cloth. So how do we do this? And also, According to the United Nations population, the latest research says that there are 15 million more cases of domestic violence which have happened in this quarter when the COVID pandemic hit. And unfortunately, they estimate that for every three months, there's going to be an uh, increase of 15 million more. So you see, if the lockdown continues till the end of the year, you know, the math, just do the map, how many more cases. And these always, I think, you know, uh, being a professor, being a researcher, the cases are a lot more than what are actually put on because so many cases are not reported. So mm -hmm. one of the other issues which I really want to talk about is unfortunately, domestic violence has increased 25% in these three months mm, and will continue to do so. But here's everything is not pessimistic, you know, but the UN agencies, uh, according to UN women, their countries such as Kenya, Trinidad and Tobago, who are making use of technology to address gender based violence. For example, you know, everybody has a cell phone, right? So there is a way there are more, more than 5 billion cell phone users globally. So they're using cell phones for people to send messages because just because you have a cell phone, it doesn't mean you may have an internet connection. And we just saw our, our esteemed colleague was having so many issues trying to get on, but you can send a message to somebody. So they're working with local partners. And also interestingly in France and Spain, um, pharmacies and supermarkets have been turned into hubs, a part of a safety network. So because supermarkets and pharmacies are still es essential services and they have not been shut down in so many places even since COVID began. So th the pharmacist, so a woman when she goes there has, can reach out to a pharmacist. So 
this has been found effective. And it's interesting that in France, almost 20,000 hotel rooms all across the country have been designated as safe spaces. So women have this opportunity to. And in, um, uh, in India, I'm, I'm originally from India, I'm Indian American, uh, so I'm wearing my Indian hat. The police department in an Indian state of Orissa or Odisha as it's called, is using telephone services to reach out to women who have lodged complaints about pre, uh, during the pre-COVID crisis, they are following up with them. And again, in Somalia, the UNDP has partnered with the local communities to implement a neighborhood watch in, in uh, initiative in local communities and make them alert to any incidents of gender-based violence. And men have also been involved. And I find, as, uh, you know, as so many of you who've been working in this for so long, that we need to work with men. It's easier said than done. And my favorite phrase when I talk to people, especially my students, I say, women are so powerful because in the spelling of we men, men are included. It's W-O-M-E-N. So what I'm trying to say is we need to come to common ground and make them aware. And I just want to share, um, an, uh, uh, which was shared by one of my students many years ago, who was a nun with the Mary Knoll sisters. And Liz told me that when she was in, um, I think it was in Ghana, and uh, they, she was in this village staying there for some time. And, she, the, and women uh, told her that there was this woman who was constantly being abused by her husband. Every night he would beat her up. So you know what all the women in the local communities did? They all got together. And when he came home, 15 of them, when he came home drunk, ready to strike his wife, they threw all the pots and pans they had brought at him. So he was like, you know, uh, what shall I say? Like all these pots and pans were thrown at him. He got hurt and he started screaming. And, and Liz told me, he said, it hurts. And so he was asked by the other women, every night you're beating up your wife. Doesn't that hurt? And let me tell you this. I love this because it's true and it stopped. He never laid his finger on her after that for as long as Liz was there. I don't know what happened after that. But what I'm trying to say is sometimes we need to take uh, this power into our own hands. And then in Mexico, where there is, as we know, there's a lot of violence against women. We know that it's all pervasive. Um, UN Women uh, is uh, working with the Luna Centers. It's L-U-N-A, and you can go online uh, and check it out. And they have created a safe space for women. Now, shifting gears, we're going to the Dominican Republic, where, again, UNDP has partnered with the bank, the BHD Bank, which is there, and to facilitate referral services for um, domestic violence cases. And also, um, UNDP has started working with the other UN agencies and with the European Union to launch what is called a Spotlight Initiative, which is a joint EU-UN partnership to end violence against women. And this global multi-year initiative aims to at least assist 50 million uh, beneficiaries directly to help them and empower them across five regions and more than 25 countries. So what do we do? So I think as NGOs, as women who care, uh, increasing various partnerships between UN agencies, academia, civil society, because one of the things we find as an academician, again, I'm removing my Indian hat and wearing my academic hat, is that we are working with our students and we work with a lot of NGOs as a lot of us do in academia. And I think one of my colleagues said she was a political science professor. I'm sure you do that with your student to, students too. You reach out to them and make them, they have to get their hands dirty. This is what I tell my daughter. This is what I tell my students. By getting your hands dirty, it means you really need to latch on, do something you believe in. You don't have to be a billionaire but you can still do it. For example, give up your cup of coffee for a uh, one month, uh, a one, one day in a year and collect that $5. If it's collected collectively, 
you can help people. So this is what I had my students do. They collected um, over $5,000 to uh, build a maternity home um, in uh, Malawi with the former first lady of Malawi. Um, so th this is, these are the, some of the things we do. And also the other thing is tweet. I mean, like I'm always tweeting or because you know what you tweet about something or post on Facebook, it's not talking about Brad Angelina, are they on or they off or how glamorous or unglamorous a movie star looks. But I think this is the time for us to use social media like what you are doing or all of us. Like I just said, I was on another webinar with the UN and then we had actually Dr. Fauci also on that and it was very interesting. I just want to bring up what he said. He said that you know, we need to really work together, which he has been saying. So we need to work together and uh, using our resources. And um, the other thing also is, Jana, I could share the link with you later. There is a specific handbook the UN has put out uh, for coordinating gender-based violence in emergencies. I'll try to put it on the chat. Uh, so it's so important that we pool our resources. So it's, it's you know, uh, one of the advantages I see, I hate to use the term in COVID is, I think it's increased our connectivity. Even though we are physically so apart, we are still closely connected and we really need to use the uh, power of social media. And again, uh, if, if everybody else, they do not have uh, access to technology, which some of us have the luxury of taking for granted, I think still there's nothing like using radio shows. And this is what some of the NGOs in India are doing. The, and maybe even in Pakistan, my colleague in Pakistan was talking about a play she wrote. Uh, so uh, I think the, some of them are using still radio uh, broadcasts and radio shows to keep in touch. And again, using cell phones to send messages. So I think um, to sum up, it's crucial that we stay connected to beat the COVID, so it's CCC, and to, to pool our resources and look at gender-based violence. And the reason I spoke about gender-based violence is because it's all pervasive and it's even impacting. Uh, Jana, when she opened, spoke about the women in jails. How many of us know that a woman who's pregnant in labor is still shackled to her bed? Where is she going to run away? Those of us who have had children, I mean, you're screaming in pain, and where are you going to run away if you're in a prison, uh, you know, when you're in labor? So this is what I'm saying. So we need to really look at this and what is the accountability? Like, you know, movements like Black Lives Matter, what we've seen in the US, I think this is really great. Like, what is the power of collective voices and force which we can do. And I think we need to transfer that because this is the 25th anniversary of the Beijing platform of, for action. 25 years ago, it was in China. And 25 years later, we need to question ourselves, have the 12 critical areas which the Beijing platform for action laid out, how much have women really benefited and how much is it why even today we we have to like you know we have to say that okay um you know oh she's a woman but just because one is a woman one is not disposable so the feeling i get having worked in global health and activism for so long like you know three decades is like why should we tell everybody we are not disposable and if a man had a period we wouldn't even have had attacks on a pad. So these are some things we need to start asking ourselves. And the last thing I just want to say before I hand it over to uh, Jana is uh, thank you so much. And I look forward to working with you. And I just want to say that the poor girl before ICPD 25, I went to Kenya for ICPD 25. And I've pretty much been at almost all the ICPDs. And, I, and to me, it was so sad that that little girl in Kenya committed suicide because her teacher shamed her because she did not have access to a sanitary pad. So where have we come as a world, as a society, if we cannot protect our own? I mean, having a pad is natural, but this young girl was shamed because she stayed in her address. She didn't have a pad. She went home and when her mother came to uh, get, uh, went to bring water, she, she came back, the child was hanging. 
So to me, that is something we can never forget. It's a natural phenomenon. It's high time we start talking about a period and a pad. Thank you so much. Thank you, Amini. Thank you for a very, um, although, although ending on that sad note, such a sad reminder, but uh, very inspiring uh, to hear about everything that's being done, you know, innovative solutions to this um, difficult problem of, uh, of domestic violence. Um, let's go to Lara next. Um, I believe you also have some slides. Do you want to um, show them yourself? Yes. Just one second. And to our uh, guests, uh, feel free to type in your questions in the chat box um, during the uh, event. If something comes to mind, we'll get to them afterwards. Okay, well, thank you again so much uh, to our partner, Dakota Alliance, uh, for having me, for having us the Center for Migration, Gender and Justice. It really is an honor to, to be here among such esteemed um, panelists to address such an important topic. Um, speaking of topic, a collaborate to accelerate the title and focus of this event truly captures the mission of the Center for Migration, Gender and Justice, which is to shrink spaces between migrant communities and uh, governing bodies. So, oh, wrong way. So who are we? We are a nonprofit, uh, non-governmental organization that addresses human rights at the intersection of migration and gender. Uh, the Center for Migration, Gender and Justice is officially registered in Germany, um, but we have representatives um, all over the world who are also um, attending this, uh, this session right now. So we are locally based, but globally engaged. That's kind of our slogan. And it is our goal to ensure gender justice beyond borders. And we believe that gender justice beyond borders necessitates shared agency representation and accountability in protecting human rights for all. So we center migrant communities in all three areas of our work, which are research, advocacy, and education. So we're currently working on several projects that address gendered health of migrants across the world. And in all of these projects, migrant communities and local organizations working with migrants have joined us in conducting research in developing advocacy strategies and in implementing education programs. So locally here in Portland, um, our project examines the impact of COVID-19 on refugee women's livelihoods through field research with refugee women and community organizations working with refugees. And this project is partially completed and preliminary findings can be found on our website and hopefully I can share some more details um, on this later. Then we also have a project that focuses on gender and health justice for Venezuelan migrants. And this is in, in its initial phase and data collection uh, process right now. The goal of the project is to monitor and assess policy, humanitarian and development efforts within the context of the global commitments that have recently been made. Um, such as the Refugee and Migrant Response Plan from Refugees and Migrants from Venezuela 2020, um, RMRP 2020, and the International Donors Conference in Solidarity with Venezuelan Refugees and Migrants in Latin America and the Caribbean. And another project that we're working on right now is kind of in preparation to, for next year's um, UNHLPF, because this is when Germany is due for, for its reports. Um, same with for the CEDA committee. So here we're working on two reports um, that address refugee women's livelihoods at um, Beijing plus 25. So drawing from these different projects, we have identified five global patterns in gendered health as it pertains to migrants that speak to the heightened needs and challenges of women, girl, LGBTQIA+, and gender diverse migrants, especially refugees and asylum seekers. Um, one of these first kind of global patterns um, that can be delineated uh, pertains to restricted access to health resources and services, largely due to migration status. A second global pattern um, that we can delineate here has to do with concerns of lack of information about health resources and services, partly due to language barriers, but also due to limited access in terms of technology and also technology literacy. Um, another pattern that emerged in our research involves limited access to gendered health resources um, and services due to interrupted 
um, infrastructures, particularly in conflict and humanitarian zones. The a fourth global pattern that already was, was spoken to, but we see this also very much increased within migrant communities is gender-based violence due to quarantine orders. And then fifth, another global pattern we delineated is persistent fear, largely due to ever-changing policies in, in migration, but also in social welfare. And so these patterns speak to the urgency of gender responsiveness in health and gender responsiveness in migration, particularly as it concerns COVID-19. Um, so the specific needs and challenges of women, girl, LGBTQIA+, and gender diverse migrants in host countries or while on the move um, still largely remain unmet from what we can see within our research. And in addressing these unmet needs and persistent challenges, community efforts really have been critical. Um, this is an additional pattern that must be emphasized here. Across all of our projects that focused on gendered health of migrants, community efforts have been central to sustaining livelihoods during this pandemic. And in many ways, community efforts have, at the very least, complemented government resources and services. Ourselves included, the research team here in, in Portland also humbly com contributed to these efforts by sourcing personal protective equipment and hand sanitizers. So um, we connected beyond the, the research project with refugee women and local organizations and became directly involved in addressing the health needs and challenges of migrant communities here in Portland. And I just want to end with this, that, you know, these are the, the various um, kind of patterns that I've just described, particularly this last one, stressing the importance of community. Really, these are all examples that demonstrate the significance of our topic today, collaborate to, to accelerate when it comes to gendered health. And I look forward to discussing this further. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lara. Um, great. Um, let's go to Christina next. Okay, I'm going to share my screen. Nice to, to be here with everyone. My name is Christina Toledo Cornell. I'm the public health director here at Lummi Travel Health Center. I'm an uh, internist, so I do primary care. Um, I serve the, uh, all the adult population here at, uh, at the Lummi Nation with, together with my colleagues. Uh, but a big focus of my practice is women's health. So I'll touch on that a little bit. Uh, but I'm going to focus most of my uh, talk on COVID-19 because I think that a lot of uh, uh, people have that in mind right now, particularly how it affects uh, Native American communities. Um, I think that we all have been following closely what's happening in Navajo Nation in the national news. Uh, and Lummi has a, a, its own story to tell, and I'm just going to be a little bit uh, sharing with you all a little bit of that story. Uh, here is uh, the map of the tribes of Washington State. Uh, I, I mentioned before at the beginning I'm from Brazil and I uh, train in the Northeast. Uh, and I actually never really took care of a whole lot of uh, Native Americans in that part of the country, but here in Washington State, actually, there are many, many tribes uh, and is uh, very common for um, uh, uh, medical um, systems have a, a big uh, percent, percent of their population be Native Americans. Uh, and the very top of the map right here uh, in this little orange part is where uh, the Lummi Nation is. Uh, it is incredibly beautiful. Uh, it has, it's surrounded by water all around it. And um, one of the biggest uh, uh, activity here at the Lummi Nation is canoe journey. Uh, and you can see why, because there's water everywhere and it's part of their uh, centuries and centuries long uh, culture traditions. Um, we focus a lot in the service we, we uh, provide looking at the social determinants of health and how they affect our population. Uh, and that looking uh, not only at the healthcare they deliver, but in the whole economic system, uh, education, uh, the community context, 
how are um, the neighborhoods develop? And here particularly, we, we discuss a lot with the government, our built-in environment, and how can that support our community? Uh, I'll move on to COVID-19 impact now. I'll show you guys some data just to have an idea how it's affecting uh, across the nation. This graph is from the CDC. I just got this yesterday, so it's pretty up to date. And if you look at the uh, rates of hospitalizations that has been um, uh, uh, looked at it by race and ethnicity here, uh, Native Americans are uh, have the highest rate of hospitalization from COVID-19 as compared to uh, uh, other um, uh, racial groups. Uh, if you look at the bottom of the graph, uh, the least affected are white people. Uh, not surprising because we know that COVID-19 is a communicable disease that's transmitted mostly for face-to-face -face interactions. And if you're the person who has to go into work or have to be part of that uh, um, uh, essential um, group of people who don't have the luxury to work from home or have that capacity to have great internet connections in your community, you'll be more likely to be affected. Uh, more regionally, uh, the Seattle uh, King County area had put together uh, a breakthrough um, of uh, the percent of COVID-19 cases by racial groups. Here uh, the, at the left hand side, you see uh, confirmed cases percentage compared to the percent of uh, people in the population. Uh, white people being the only ones whose percent, which is the uh, percent of case is the this brown uh, darker area and the gray shaded area is the percent of people in the population. White people being the only group of people whose percent of case is smaller than their percentage of their group in the population. Uh, blacks and Latino be disproportionately affected. Uh, Native America just slightly here in the, in the Seattle area. When uh, we look more locally here, Whatcom County, where we are located, uh, we can see at the top, again, the same idea, the darker color is the percent of cases uh, and the lighter color is the percent of people in the population. Um, uh, Native Americans are about 7% affected compared to only being 3% of our local population. Uh, when we look at those uh, numbers, we worry that um, uh, here locally that we are being disproportionately affected, but uh, I'll tell you a little more that actually that perhaps is uh, a result of our response uh, and being able to detect every case. Uh, this is our own internal data here. My colleague just um, uh, made a statement this morning for me. Uh, when we look at, we had had 43 positive cases here, the elimination, uh, while our county has had 681, you can see here our total population in our reservation is 5,300 people versus uh, 230,000 in the, the bigger community. Uh, in our, um, if you look all the way here at the bottom, uh, our percent of positives is 0.8% of the total population versus the Whatcom County is 0.3%. But I think a, a big reason that this um, difference is that we have tested so much more of our population as compared to our surrounding community. And I think that this is actually um, a positive thing because we have been able to identify, in my estimation, every single case in this community since we were able to do a more universal testing. At the beginning, we had limited testing, so we didn't test everyone who probably had a, like immediate family members who had no symptoms. Uh, since then, we have been aggressively testing everyone, and we feel very strongly that we have been able to identify uh, the vast majority of the cases uh, who hear the reservation. And so far, we had had no one who had died, uh, only two hospitalizations. So in that sense, I feel that our response has been pretty strong um, and a part to be celebrated. Uh, and the reason I think for that is there is a lot of community resilience. It's a big part of the lamination. Uh, and part of a lot of this is, is based on uh, centuries long traditions. Uh, this word Shilangan, uh, it stands for our way of life. Um, and I mentioned I'm not Native American, I'm from Brazil, but I work closely with a lot of my Native American communities, uh, uh, friends and coworkers, and I, I learn a great deal from 
uh, my patients as well. And, and the biggest part of the, the resilience is their uh, uh, traditional foods, their connection with nature, this really big cultural and social cohesion that uh, the community have this big respect for elders. And we know that elders are the ones that are dying uh, mostly around the country. Uh, so the idea that we need to protect that population is very important to the community. Um, and then uh, another big portion of the response is this idea of self-determination where uh, LAMIs can make the, our own laws and rules. Uh, so this really has allowed uh, the, the local government here to have a robust response. Uh, but for the part that I'm mostly uh, part of is our health system and the public health system. And having a universal healthcare system that's free of charge for everyone uh, and be integrated within our greater health system has been uh, really one great way of practicing medicine and public health at the same time because it really is that no one goes without health care, no one goes without having access. Uh, having this discussion about uh, menstrual pads and access to this, um, uh, I'll talk a little bit more about uh, this, this portion, uh, uh, bringing down to women's health. Uh, the the Lummi Tribal Health Center, part of one whole part of uh, the system is uh, the maternal uh, child health, and that's really focused on women's health. And when women deliver their babies, they get a visit from a public health nurse, and there's uh, a lot of connections with the services. For example, if they need a pump, uh, if they need pads, um, even if they need diapers for their children. So there's a big uh, emphasis on coordinating all those services with, within our big uh, health system. Uh, and then we work closely, uh, myself even, uh, 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 we, we give um, substance use treatment directly from, uh, from primary care, which has opened up uh, a great way of integrating the, the care for people who need it, working very closely with our psychiatry department and psychologists so that it's one uh, cohesive integrated care system. Uh, and then I mentioned before that I am a woman's health doctor most of my time, so we, we do a lot to uh, provide care for women. Uh, one, I think the biggest success of the lamination is uh, something called same day long acting reversal contraception. And I mentioned before, service is free. Uh, I, re I remember as a med student when I was uh, rotating in Houston uh, in the ob -GYN department, I had this uh, black woman who came in. She had a hemoglobin of five. Uh, and if you are in the medical field, you know that, but maybe if you're not, you may not understand. That means that you can hardly walk around because you're bleeding so heavily from your menstrual period that you're, she was passing out. Like it's really incompatible with life. She needed a blood transfusion. And that's because she couldn't afford the $50 uh, payment for her birth control because in Houston, uh, there's very little access uh, for people who, it, this is pre-Obamacare, but even after Obamacare, there's still a big chunk of the population who doesn't qualify for free health care or even access to oral contraception, even for medical care. Um, so we hopefully that that's never a problem here. We have a uh, same day, if a woman decided that they want a long acting reversal contraception, they can get it uh immediately uh and that's a big big emphasis of our services and it has really helped uh in the last five years incredibly uh decrease our rates of teenage pregnancy uh and then we offer all the service like weight management um and uh access to prep for uh men who has for anybody really but particularly for the community of men who has sex with men so that uh, they feel protected uh, and one, as a public health official, one of my biggest concerns is uh, infectious disease. And I spend a lot of my time uh, with vaccination campaigns for both kids and uh, adults, but particularly for hepatitis D, uh, because we, my biggest concern is that women is affected different for hepatitis B, that if they do get affected when they're pregnant, they can transmit to their children, which then uh, are unlikely to be able to get rid of it. Uh, so this is, uh, my presentation and hope if you have questions let me know thank you christina that was so interesting i couldn't agree with you more about the importance of a, a public and free healthcare system you know this is something where the whole country could learn from uh, the lamination it seems um uh, let me jump to um, Catherine Ainamani because I think she's online. She managed to get back on. Uh, 
Catherine, I'm going to unmute you. Uh, let's see if this is going to work. Catherine? It's still on mute. Catherine, can you try to unmute yourself? Okay. There you go. Uh, so. Okay, I think we I can. I think hear I'm a bit clearer right now. Yes, yes. So let me ask you so you, you represent the LGBTI community in Uganda, and I think that many of us know that um, Uganda is not a great place for your kind of people, and uh, you experience a lot of discrimination, of course, in many parts of the world as well. Yeah, true. Uh, do you find that this exactly. affects healthcare? Um, women, uh, you know, women, LGBTI people's healthcare in Uganda, both like in general. Um, and especially now during the pandemic. Yeah. I hope we can hear you. Now I can't hear you again. Yeah. It okay. So here in Uganda, when you want to get like healthcare, uh, most of the hospitals, you have to first join insurance. So uh, you find it very hard when you find yourself like you're going to register as a team of LGBTI, you have your team and you want to be get insured in a hospital that you can get easy, healthy care, it becomes a challenge. Some of the members are shy, uh, some they feel discriminated. So we, we feel really, really discriminated and it's fine, it's fair and you, you to talk about yourself, you really find it hard. Uh, even when you're going to test these, uh, the, the STIs and what these things, such, such things, you really find it very, very difficult because there's no way you can express yourself to the, to the medical people because you, some of the, 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 uh, the members, they feel shy and you find it is really hard. Right. So you find that this is not just the general population that has these biases, but also the medical um, providers. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, have you experienced any particular difficulties now during the COVID pandemic? Mm. Yeah, we've really got some difficulties. Uh, of course, right now, uh, like in Uganda, they, we've been given a uh, few time, so you cannot move beyond uh, beyond seven. Actually, beyond six, you're yeah. not allowed to move. Yeah, and. Um, some of the places, are, uh, some districts are still closed, especially these ones which are near the border, border districts. Uh, uh, for example, my district is a border district, Kabbalah is near Rwanda, and uh, you find it is hard for us members because we have teams of the LGBTIs. We usually had, before COVID, we usually had, you used to have meetings, we used to, to meet as a team and we see how we can go forward, but this time we cannot meet because of the, 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 the lockdown, the transport fares are now high. So it is really difficult to move from a, a district to another one, especially now that the district, the border district are not allowed to, to, to transport people. They only transport cargo. So we have faced really a, a lot of challenge. We no longer meet to, uh, we just communicate on phone, like that is it. Even the hospital, the care, the, so it is really, really hard uh, to travel to the hospital because some of us were, uh, some of the members were using uh, hospitals in Kampala where they are not known. Like when uh, the member of the LGBT team, when she, or he gets sick, uh, he has to get to, to, to travel from Kampala to be discriminated. So right now, because of the transport and uh, this COVID-19 thing, it's really, really difficult to move from Kabale to Kampala, since they don't allow, they, since they only allow public transport. So private means they've not yet started allowing that, so it really becomes hard. Um, are you aware of any government efforts to improve the situation for LGBTI people? Hello? Yes. Can, did you hear me, Catherine? Come again? I, um, I was asking, are you aware of any government efforts to improve the situation for LGBTI uh, people? And the not, not really. They are still discriminated. They are still discriminated, really. There's no effort that the government is put to, to
to favor the LGBTI people. Mm -hmm. However, us as the, as the organization of ALOA, we are developing an intensified strategic approach with the overall goal to advocate the protection and pro promotion of the LGBTI rights and groups. So this will happen by strengthening and networking the CSOs, and at the same time by engaging and sensitizing the wider public and state authorities of the negative effects that are caused by the marginalization, discrimination, and extremely limited protection of the LGBTI, the LGBTI groups by trying to address the causes for the transphobia in the society. Therefore, the result of the forcing structure long-term action uh, will contribute to a higher level of comprehension or understanding of causes uh, and mistreatment towards the LGBTI persons. So uh, we are, us as an organization, we are looking forward to, to see how we can advocate for the rights and work with the, um, with the state officials. So, and do you have any allies? Do you have other civil society organizations uh, that you can collaborate with in this effort? Catherine? Catherine, can you hear me? Boy, this is really patchy. Um, okay. Um, let's see if we can get her back later. Let's move on to Tanzila. Um, can Tanzila, can you pick up in, uh, from here? Yes, of course, sure. Assalamualaikum, everyone, and my uh, fellow panelists. They Hello. have uh, three. Okay, we've we've got Catherine back. Uh, she can continue. I think her point. Let's see if we can get her. Well, oh, no, I don't see her anymore. Um, okay, shall I? I um. Oh wait. Hold on. Um, Catherine, are you still able to talk? Catherine, uh, I'm trying to unmute her. See, I can't even unmute her now. Okay, so Catherine, if you can hear me, we can, we'll circle back to you later, okay? Um, we'll give it over to Tanzila at this point. I'm also gonna t send a WhatsApp message if she um, doesn't hear me. Um, so yeah, uh, you can go ahead, Tanzila. Okay, so I was listening to my fellow panelists and I think they have really highlighted some important issues that I can definitely resonate with. So. I want to share a quick story that I have always been an avid public speaker as a profession and as a professional and I've spoken for women rights, SRHR and cross cutting other themes like adolescent. I'm reaching 30 so I can't call myself youth anymore but I'm sure I'm reaching out to a more important uh, age bracket that's going to do wonders for the world. So speaking of issues of young people but Two years ago, I started a startup by the name Girly Things. And the only reason why I started that was because I, since I am on the wheelchair, I was on the road once and I started my period out of nowhere. And that day I realized I've been living in this beautiful city of Lahore in Pakistan for the past 29 years. And I, I don't have access to a sanitary napkin. I have the money in my pocket. I can purchase it, but there's still vacuum between me and healthcare. And not, not just healthcare, something closer to me as a lifestyle, which I require as a woman. And I think that's when it hit me that even today, women have a lot of barriers in accessing healthcare. Prior to that, I'd been to so many events. I've been part of Women Deliver. I've been part of Quota Alliance. And we talk, we share, and we know the solutions, but we have very few actors who are putting them out there. We can't just completely depend on policy change. We need bigger solutions like entrepreneurship. And I think that's when my entrepreneurial spirit kicked in and a mobile application we came up with by the name Girly Things that you can certainly download and check out. And we deliver feminine hygiene products to women across Pakistan and ranging towards also SRHR and reproductive health related products. And the whole idea of the USP is that it's done in a very uh, private, anonymous way. So the only person who knows what's inside is us as a team and we maintain privacy and the person who's ordered it. So there, there are no actors in between. And we realize that that is giving a lot of empowerment to other women. But after two years of running that, I remember this year in January, I was a bit huffed up because we had gotten two awards, one international, one na national, and 
no investor every time i would walk into a room the room is filled with amazing rich men who really want to empower young people of the world but the moment you talk about reproductive health of women you you say the word period you say the word blood they just don't get it it's like they you know you have, you have to go back to school with them and tell them what biology is and i realized that though it's, it's a very hard job for me and i've invested all of my savings all of my money into this it has paid off in a way that we have started this conversation in the private sector and we have started this conversation in the, in the startup world about connecting srhr women's health with making money coming up with sustainable ideas so when covid happened i was literally on the verge of shutting this down because it was not working and i was losing money and i wanted to just apply for my masters go to germany and maybe start fresh but when covid happened we started getting calls from the most remo- remotest areas of pakistan and i'm like hey wait a minute these girls have technology you are my girls you know that's my girl and we started delivering these products to them and they literally rejuvenated me firstly i was so happy to see that women even in remote areas do have access to technology and and now we need to create a network not just deliver products but also deliver information so for the past 6 months i think i'm living a new life rejuvenated delivering products every day and we are trying to you know generate these ambassadors of women's health in different communities who are going to talk about not just menstrual health care but also identify where women are facing issues like domestic violence and as we've segued into the conversation about covid-19 we've realized that there's this general taboo around health in in pakistan at least and there's a thing that that is erupting and that is corona shaming and many of the people over here even if they suspect any symptoms of corona they might be hesitant to walk into a clinic and get themselves tested because they fear what will what will the neighbors say and i am quite well aware of the shame part because i have been working in the feminine health industry for a while and i realized that this connects with so much that women go through on everyday life and this is an area that needs to be explored and spoken about in very creative ways i want to share two stories about here dr murthy mentioned um, about violence and the increasing number of cases uh, even as we speak right now there are two cases very close to me that i want to talk about one a friend of mine a very good friend of mine she contacted um, uh, she got corona she became corona positive and she's a very empowered person she's driven she's amazing she's out there she's a go getter and her family reacted in such a demeaning way that she had to leave the house overnight she had to call the authorities and this is where i feel extremely proud of my country sometimes we don't reach out to authorities thinking mm, no they're men they're not going to listen to us especially with domestic cases but in her case they did listen to her she was provided security overnight she was helped in packing her stuff she she evacuated and she kept in touch with the security for a very long time until she reached her destination she got a house and rent and she shifted there and now she's happily happily setting her new house and her family does not know where she is right now but this is a case for somebody who could afford it and she had savings on the other side i have another friend who is visually impaired and even as i speak right now i know i have to give her a call right after this session because she's going through the most troublesome life at home she's visually impaired she's not allowed to go to the office because it's locked down and she's unable to cope with the situation at home about how her family is treating her which was the case since the beginning but now because of covid covid 19 everything has escalated so we have these stories in place and we need to be very quick about solutions and lastly i also want to talk about creative mediums you see we are definitely facing a situation right now that is really hard to analyze and we we're, we're getting deeper and deeper into it considering disability as a person myself i think i'm really i'm really empowered yet i could not get a sanitary napkin considering 90% of other uh, disabled population here of pakistan they have issues that need to be addressed as soon as possible and it's like it's like a journey that everybody needs to take together for me i think one of the mediums that i took over was that of creativity so we did, did a lot of theater around taboo 
and shame just to get these stories out because no matter how much we talk with the politicians or we try to come up with solutions if we do not have the right stories i doubt we can really um, escalate or maybe uh, amplify the change that we're trying to bring so recently we came up with a, a comedy short film on disability and it was something unheard of here in pakistan because every time you talk about disability it's like a sad sob story nobody wants to hear and i don't look like a sobbing person to any one of you at all i think i i utilize the experience of disability and apply them to other systems and experiences also even to this the situation of corona and what disabling attitudes are doing to patients and their families so but the whole idea is that we need more creative mediums to talk about issues that are taboo and to communicate with communities that are difficult to communicate with so i think these were like a couple of points that i wanted to share i'll just uh, share the link of the short film over here please watch it but after the session thank you very much thank you so much um very good let me just see if um catherine is still available no i think we lost her uh if you notice in the chat box we have a a message from uh about uganda from uh participant ruth wakala i don't know if she is in uganda uh yes she is in uganda um let's see ruth would you like to say something i could uh you could take the microphone if, if you wanted to say that uh if you want if you want to speak on the uh panel I think you can just unmute yourself. Yes. Hello? Yes. Emphasize on that point that I've raised during the first three weeks. It's a little choppy. Your sound is a little choppy. Yeah, uh, just to emphasize on that point. Uh-huh. Public transport was not allowed to move, even in private vehicles. So most of them who were far from hospitals, health centers, they were not allowed to move. So some women really had it rough because they could not access hospitals. They could not, for especially those who are pregnant, um, those, who are, those who were sick, taking like, those who are supposed to meet, have appointments, who had appointments, they could not meet their doctors privately because of, because of transport. Mm. That sounds and pretty also, so, some of, Yes, some yeah. of them, some of them who are taking their, who are supposed to take their children for immunization, equally they were affected because of transport. The first two weeks of, of lockdown was really tough. Do you think uh, women had children at home instead of going to the hospital? Yeah, S some had, some have, most of them, of course, they, as a family, they had have children to take for immunization. They have children, those who have HIV and they have to visit hospitals to get medicine. So the first two weeks was really tough for them. Yes, that somehow doesn't sound like it was very well thought out. Um, uh, let's, um, uh, uh, let me ask the panelists, do you have any questions for each other? could give you the floor. Yeah, um, actually, I have a comment. I mean, thank you so much, but I really liked, uh, you know, Tanzila, when you shared about uh, this, because it doesn't matter whether you have, uh, you're in full capability of all your senses or you have what I would say a special need. I don't like to use the term disability. Uh, uh, you know, it is so sad and it is, uh, as you said, this COVID, um, uh, shaming. I think it's so bad because people are talking about like uh, uh, it's an STI or, you know, it's as bad as somebody has tuberculosis or HIV. So again, I think, you know, I'm definitely going to watch what you posted 
And I also posted um, the link to the UN uh, Women Report on the chat for anybody who wants to take it. But I think this is so nice because we need to have more dialogues like this. And you know what, when you're talking about media, what came to my mind, Tanzila, is to have something which is universally understood without language being the barrier, you know, like a cartoon character or something, have different avatars for the cartoon character or something. So I think this is really important. And uh, thank you all so much for your presentation. I think it was really nice. And this thing, and good luck to everybody, and especially to you, Tanzila, because I really think, um, you know, you deserve a lot of accolades. And have you ever thought of the Gates um, Challenge Grant? Maybe we should talk uh, uh, privately after that, you, me, and Jana, because Jana, the Gates Challenge Grant, it's a very short thing. I think yeah. you have a good shot. You're talking about investors. You know, yeah. that's why I mentioned the period, because I tell them, like, without a period, you wouldn't be here. If your mother never had a period, you wouldn't be born. End of story. You know? That's right. it. It's right. so stupid. It's like as though it's a shame to have a period, you know? So I think this is something you could think about it. And um, great. And is this downloadable on Android and iPad? Uh, the girly things. And that's G-I-R-L-I-E-T-H-I-N-G-S. Is that it? Yes. I'll just type uh, the name of the app over here. Yes, it's available on iOS and Android. Uh-huh. And it's just, it's just one word, girly things. And okay, thank you got so it. Much. Yeah, okay, girly. And also, yeah, I think, you know, I'll put you in touch with um, this other NGO. I'm working with Jana, as I mentioned, you know, to get out these recyclable pads. So let us see uh, how we can get some over, you know, because they work everywhere. And I think it's really nice. Um, again, Absolutely. and good luck. Thank you. We're game. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, can I ask you, like, um, I, I want to give, uh, if anybody are in the audience has questions, please go ahead now and type them into the chat box. Um, in the meantime, I'd like to ask uh, Zila, uh, what would be sort of the one, two or three things that you think that your government could do to help uh, people, women in your situation? Well, uh, of course, they, there's a long list. And uh, one thing, um, Dr. Yana, I have figured out is that, you know, sometimes the government does want to help a particular community, but there is so much division within that community. And sometimes, you know, one group is trying to get over the other group. And uh, this is me, like, I'm like the, the, the cool kid who's, who's friends with all the groups. And I invite all of them to my birthday party. So, and I've realized that, you know, if you all work together, the government will hear you because this is something that is, you, you can't really deny um, support for periods. You can't really deny disability rights. It's horrendous. I mean, that person should be put down uh, of any leadership pedestal right away. But there's not just the government where the issue lies. It's also the community where the issue lies. Sometimes the government is providing uh, good services, rights, but it's manipulated and it's misused by the community. So. For a very long time as an advocate, I questioned the government. I fought with the government. They listened to me. They invited me to their house for a cup of tea and some biscuits. And we had a very peaceful conversation. But the moment I came back to my community and I tried to tell them that this is what we need to do, the response was quite different. So I would want to tell the government is that they need to have more accountable laws. And let me give a quick example. Day before yesterday, um, I had gone to a hospital to get my interview done. Pakistan has a law that if you have a disability, you can import a duty free, free car for yourself. And I had applied for that scheme and I got selected. And the only reason I wanted to experience that are they actually doing what they claim? And once I went there, it was actually a very smooth process. They were actually dealing with everyone with a lot of empathy. So I think that it's like a two-way thing. I would invite the government to have more dialogues, to continue their efforts, identify the flaws in the schemes that they have, and trying to be more accountable. By the end of the day, women and men and trans people or whatever identities they are with disabilities need to feel like a citizen who are equally accountable and not feel like children that um, his 
a candy for you. Here's a chocolate for you. We love you. You're so adorable. Give us some motivation. Something like that. They need to give taxes. They need to have jobs. They need to be fired. They need to be publicly shamed if uh, they harass someone else um, or if they do something that a good citizen should not do. That's when, you know, we would feel like uh, we're part of the system and we would want to, we would feel empowered only then. That's what I think. That would be real equality, right? Uh, there's uh, actually, Christina is asking a question here um, relating to the menstrual issues. Are menstrual cups an option? Uh, they're uh, prices, but you can use the same yes, cup for Christina, months. Uh, we, we have all types of uh, menstrual products available on our uh, app, and we also have a website, by the way. Menstrual cups, tampons, reusable sanitary napkins, regular uh, pads, and we are also introducing biodegradable sanitary napkins that uh, one of our champion entrepreneur, her name is Subaina, she started, uh, the name of the product is Onaps. So I think Pakistan would also be leading in producing biodegradable sanitary napkins and we'll be selling them. Yes, okay. Um, let me see, um, still looking for Catherine yes. here. I Thank don't you, Kyle, you found it. Um, uh, Ruth, are you able to comment if I ask you the same question? Uh, what would be the two, three things that you would want to see the government do for, uh, uh, well, I don't know if you can speak for the LGBTI community, but, but let's say for Ugandan women in general, if you like. Where do you, where do you see the biggest needs? I'm trying to unmute Ruth, but I don't know if this is gonna work. Maybe one of the biggest needs is to improve the internet connections in Uganda. This is not working. Um, okay, let's go to uh, Christina. What would be on your wish list for your community? Uh, one of, I think one of the biggest thing uh, is universal kindergarten. Uh, that to me is my wish list. I think that children who start early on uh, have a much better chance in life, particularly if their parents don't have access to as much uh, resources um, as as, as it is in this community. Uh, I lived in Boston before I moved here and the government there was pushing really hard to start kindergarten at four year old. Uh, and you could definitely see the major difference for kids coming into uh, kindergarten and first grade there. They were so much better prepared. Uh, and then uh, the US really criminalizes um, drugs a great deal. And I think that causes a disproportional impact, as we talked about already, of uh, the number of colored women uh, and women in general in incarceration. Um, I think that that certainly affects Native American communities throughout the, the nation, uh, incarceration over minor things like drug possession, drug paraphernalia, that kind of thing. Uh, and then lastly is really uh, making uh, treatment for um, uh, uh, substance use a lot more accessible and uh, less cumbersome to come by. Uh, oftentimes, uh, people are trying to get access to those services and uh, they're not available. And we, we don't necessarily have a lot of those services here, so we depend on outside communities, uh, particularly for alcohol use, um, and that usually is a big barrier. Okay. Um, can I pose the same question to Lara in terms of refugees, migrants and refugee women? Um, what do you think, uh, and of course you can, you can look at it locally or globally, whichever you want, but um, what, what sort of um, concerns you most? Yeah, thank you. And I think I'll, I'll speak uh, on, on Europe, particularly since the, the EU is right now in, in the making of conceiving a new EU pact on migration um, and asylum. So I would say the, the three major things here is to actually establish a gender responsive framework for migration politics that is premised on intersectionality, right? We always, um, within within that discourse in, in migration and um, in migration discourse and politics, there is a lot of gender negligence. So there's just this this one experience of migrants or of refugees, which is often that of, of males. Um, so being res gender responsive then means inclusive of all different kinds of experiences, including those of women, girl, LGBTQIA+, and gender diverse uh, migrants. 
a second uh, call or recommendation would be to uh, just Im improve the data. Um, if we don't, if we, if, if these spe the specific needs and challenges of women, girl, LGBTQIA plus, and gender diverse uh, migrants are not accounted for, it's it's difficult to to, to address them. So it's very critical that there is evidence based gender and migration politics in order to um, am amplify and in many ways emphasize these specific experiences, but then also, of course, to, to address them. And so that these policy mis mismatches that exist between actual lived experiences and policies and, and laws that are governing these experiences, that we can shrink these, these mismatches. And the last one would be an accountability framework, right? There, um, migrants, particularly, again, migrant women, girls, LGBTQIA+, and gender diverse migrants are talked about but not talked with. So there needs to be an accountability framework um, with um, shared representation, shared agency, and shared, shared accountability. So those would be the three main calls for action that, um, that you know, we have issued with regards to this new pact on migration and asylum that have specific gender dimensions. Thank you. Um, so thank you, everybody. We're coming to the end of our time here. Um, I think that, um, you know, maybe the take, I, I think the take home message from all of this is a collaboration. It's, it sort of comes through and everything everybody's saying. Um, collaboration is empowering and uh, um, let's continue to do that. Um, and uh, uh, for those of you who represent uh, organizations that are not yet CODA members, we invite you to join. Uh, get in touch with us and uh, um, our next panel actually is going to be uh, in September on sustainable fashion which uh, is something you know a topic that touches on many women's lives um, I don't have the date yet but uh, we're working on it so uh, you'll get inform information about that later um, thank you to everybody who attended and thank you so much to all our panelists um, and uh, have a good rest of the summer and uh, stay safe. Okay, thank you so much.